You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we're picking our pods in Fab Facts. We're making good use of the things that we find in the randomizer. And it's SIG for Captain Scarlet Vault author Chris Bentley. That's all coming up in pod 226 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Hello and welcome Ooh. to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. God. We're your hosts, Richard James and Jamie Anderson. What? We're here for the next hour and a half talking all things Jerry Anderson. If you're a fan of sci-fi, <laughs> Super Marionation, or even the live-action shows, you've come to the right place. We've got all sorts of things to keep you amused for the next um, 90 minutes or so, including Chris Dale's amazing randomizer, Fab Facts, Jerry Anderson News, some input from our lovely listeners, and part three of Jamie's interview with Captain Scarlet the Vault author, Chris Bentley. Wow. Should we go? What's that happened? Right? We done. What have you? Well, I'm just Are being, being hyper efficient. I'm just being hyper efficient, getting everything done <laughs> early on so we can get home early. Well, yeah. you may think you're uh, oh. Captain Smarty, but what you failed yes. to say oh, no. uh, is that. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with this podcast, as oh, many podstrons yes. have done, you can email us podcast at jerryanderson.com <sighs> or tweet you're us. Right. I'm Jamie Anderson, he's Richard Very James, good. or Chris yes. Darlick, the uh, random meister, and use the yep. hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast. I noticed earlier today, in fact, yeah. somebody on a thread on Twitter had tweeted, what sort of um, sci-fi and fantasy genre podcasts should exist but don't? Right. And somebody replied, well, one about Jerry Anderson and his shows. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. So obviously yeah. I in- instantly replied. So if you are that person and you're now listening and you're now a podster and welcome along, thank you for tweeting. Yes. And sorry you missed us so far. Yes, but you've got a lot of catching up to do. 225 odd podcasts. Yes. Before you, you know, before you've listened to them all. It's, and that's, Amazing. it's many days worth of solid listening. Yes, so, um, it really is. Uh, and of course, Jamie, since yeah. we last met, yes. I mean, I know we're recording this a little bit ahead of time, but yes. Yes. it was Thunderbirds Day. And our yes. fantastic fab live event at the Moxie Hotel in Slough. That was fun, wasn't it? We had a very jolly time. We were very, very pleased to be joined by a number of podsterons. Yeah, that was great. Seb Burr, really nice. Robert Monk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah and Leon was there as well with his lovely Leon's story. As well, well. yes. Yeah. Thanks for joining yeah. us, Leon. Uh, no, it was really, really nice. And then we had a lovely curry. Oh, and Al as well. I have to say hello to Al. Oh, and Al as well. Yes, yeah, sorry, Al. Yeah. yeah. So uh, next time we do another Fab Live, if mm. you're in the local region, do pop along and join in the fun, because it's really nice to have a bit of an audience. And yeah, it'd be nice to see that, great uh, fun. that grow, I think. Yes. And yeah, then, we can, uh, then we can start charging for tickets. Put into double digits next time. <laughs> uh, no, it was a really, really nice thing to do. So thanks for joining us. Whether you join us in person or online, if you missed it, you can re-watch it on the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel, youtube.com slash TV. Now, right. you've already done the intro stuff. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that means, yeah, in fact, you've hastened yeah. us along. Right, good. Let's get it over and done with then. Come on. To Fab Facts. <laughs> quick, quick, quick. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. It's Fab Facts. I've yeah. got a book of Fab Facts. I'll flick through the book to find a Fab Fact stopped only in my flicking by Richard James's cry of Fab. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Richard. Yeah. Are you yeah. ready with said cry? Born ready. Then here comes the book. Fab! Oh, I did overshoot there slightly, but you'll did forgive you? me, won't well, you? I'll go back a few pages. No. I'm, All right. I'm, I've stopped, so I'm yeah. sticking with the page here. All right. Well, there's a nice photograph. Now, this is actually one that I will think will appeal to a lot of people. And oh, I wonder how many change. will guess this correctly. Now, Richard, off the top of your head... Do you yeah. happen to know which of Thunderbird 2's pods was most often used in the original Thunderbird television series and both feature films? No. Well, you may not know, but I'm sure it's kept you and many other listeners awake at nights worrying about it constantly, I imagine. Um, okay. I thought so. Far, anyway, 
anyway, here we are to give you a top pod ranking countdown thing to oh find my. out the most used pod in Thunderbird 2 in Thunderbirds. Great. Now, okay. some of you may instantly think that it's going to be pod 4, since it usually holds Thunderbird 4. But... Let's not be too hasty here. We've got all six right. pods to choose from, all full of useful equipment, but some pods were definitely used more than others. Right, okay. Now, for the purposes of this countdown, we are sticking very strictly indeed to the original 32 TV episodes and the two feature films, yep. and we won't be counting cameo appearances by a pod. So, for instance, if pod three rolls by on the conveyor, but Virgil ultimately picks pod six, it doesn't count on the list as use of pod three. It Harsh. only counts for the purpose of this list if they've actually been loaded aboard Thunderbird 2 and flown away from base on a mission. Right. Are we clear? Understood. Richard, are you ready? Yes. Podsterons, are you ready? Yes. Okay then, let's find out the nation's favourite pod. In sixth place, it's Pod 2, which was only used in a measly one mission in the original TV series, and that was to fly Chip the Annoying Kid back home while he slept in the episode Security Hazard. So, yes, for all the amazing equipment held in the other pods, Pod 2 apparently has a bed. So okay. that's good to know, isn't it? Uh, in fifth yep. place, it's Pod 1, which was only used in two missions in the television series. In fourth place, Pod 6, used in just four missions. Here's where it gets interesting. Does it? In third place, yes. it's pod four. So if you thought it was pod four, ah. you were incorrect, Podstrons. Yeah. Pod four was used in seven episodes of the television series, plus the feature film Thunderbirds Argo, for a total of eight missions. Okay. So in second place, it's pod five which was also used in seven episodes of the television series and Thunderbirds Argo and Thunderbird 6, making it nine missions for Pod 5. So right. if you've been keeping track, you'll know that in first place, it's Pod 3, used yes. in 11 missions on television. So right. what is in Pod 3 that makes it so special? Well, let me list those things for you. The elevator cars, the domo, even the mole and the firefly on occasion. However, there's another reason why Pod 3 scores so high on this list, and that is because Pod 3 was generally the pod chosen for missions when they never actually used the pod equipment, particularly in the second season. It just seemed to be Virgil's kind of go-to generic pod whenever he needed a pod on Thunderbird 2 to get it flying. Oh, okay. Now... We should stress that there is a bit of room to fudge things with this list in the um, accuracy department, That's since the show was not 100% consistent in its use of stock footage um, around the Thunderbird 2 launch sequence. For example, in the episode Day of Disaster, after Virgil selects Pod 4, and Thunderbird 2 slowly lowers onto Pod 4, as it trundles out of the launch bay, we can yeah. now see Pod 2 on Thunderbird 2's left, which means that Thunderbird 2 must have Pod 3 in it at that point. <laughs> right. Except that when it gets to the danger zone and drops off the pod in the river, it's Pod 4 again, because pod the mission four, needed yeah. Thunderbird 4. So, yeah. There's also yeah. some episodes where we just don't know which pod was taken because we're not shown or told. And even a couple of episodes where Jeff tells the boys which number pod to take, they agree with him, and then they take a different pod entirely. But... <laughs> right. Even if the number of appearances aren't 100% correct, depending on how you look at it, the overall ranking should be. So that is 5th right. place pod wow. 1. Sorry, 6th place pod 2, 5th place pod 1, 4th yeah. place pod 6, 3rd yeah. place pod 4, 2nd yeah. place pod 5, and 1st place pod 3. Amazing. Oh, there you go. Crikey. Now, I've got a follow-up fact to that, which is the most listened to uh, pods of the podcast. So starting <laughs> with... No, no, we're not, we, we're not doing that list because that we're would take three that. hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But isn't that interesting? It's, it's amazing, the continuity thing as well, because, you know, yes. these days you could not get away with it. This is kind mm. of getting to Game of Thrones coffee cup moment. That's um, right. But we're all much yes. more forgiving because it's from the 1960s. Yes, and as we often say, it was only meant to be seen once. It wasn't meant to be released on video, DVD and Blu-ray. We're not, we weren't supposed to pour over every episode more than once. No, we? no pouring that's at a, all, in fact. No, no, no. Oh, that's very good. Well, I shall sleep better tonight. I knew it. Knowing those facts. Yeah, well, yeah. me too. Me too. Yeah. Um, but also, if you, if you do want to sleep better, then it seems to be the best thing to do is to get into pod two, which is equipped with a very comfy bed. Yeah, well, that's also that sounds lovely. Good to it? know, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think there's someone somewhere that has a Thunderbirds pod themed bedroom? 
Oh, you know, like I hope very often so. You see, yeah, there are, people have, you know, Star Trek-themed bedrooms or living rooms. I wonder if someone somewhere has got a pod or even a Thunderbird-themed, like a proper Thunderbird-themed bedroom. I don't just mean posters and merch. I mean like the inside of either one of the pods or one of the craft themselves. Or to get into bed, you lean backwards against a picture and slide oh, down a, a series of, of really complex ramps and eventually end up in your nightgown yes. uh, and in bed. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you're, if you're Wallace and Gromit... Uh, yeah. from said franchise then that may be the case <laughs> but i suspect not but if you do have a uh, an anderson themed bedroom or house or room at all uh, yeah. do let us know podcast at jerryanderson.com we'd love yeah. to hear from you we would gosh well there you go i thought that was quite interesting actually for uh, a fan yeah. fact let us know if you agree podstrons mm. podcast at jerryanderson.com but for now i think that brings us to the end of this week's Countdown fact. fact! What? Yeah, I you mean, could have had well, pod fact. Sure. No, but I... <laughs> Jamie, I suspect, and I don't know if this is true, but I suspect off the top of my head yes. that we've already had, at some point, a pod fact. I'm sure we, we have, must have done. but this was the perfect exactly. news... T- <sighs> no, but I'm trying not to repeat, that's all. However... Hang on, you're... Jamie, uh, <laughs> did... What? <laughs> you do know the format of this podcast, right? Yeah, trying not to repeat true, things. Right. Go on. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Now, you did just mention our uh, email address, podcast mm. at jerryanderson.com, and I'm very pleased to say a lot of our lovely podstrons have been putting finger to keyboard since yes, we last night, so they've been sending in some emails. For example, this one's from James Munro, who says, Hello to our hosts of the Gubbins, <laughs> which I quite like. <laughs> the Gubbinators? Yeah, that's right. He said, I've just finished listening to the latest pod, uh, 223 at time of writing. In it, Jamie expressed a bitter surprise at Peril in Peru being the most popular of the current trio of Mm. John Thaden audio dramas. As Peril is my favourite of the three, I might have an idea why that is. Yeah. So James says, Peril is the closest of the trio to a traditional Thunderbirds adventure. Terror from the Stars contains an alien menace, which would be off-putting for some Thunderbirds fans. For myself, the aliens just about fit into the world, but only by a narrow squeak. With Operation Asteroids, you have a fantastic showdown with the Hood, but that is the main focus of the story. Any rescues during the story are somewhat incidental. In Peril in Peru, the first third is one big rescue mission, followed by a fun investigation segment, and finally, the rescue chase that you sometimes got at the end of some episodes. Uh. Talking of the audio, says James, some weeks back, you were kind enough to answer my overly in-depth list of five questions. Having re-listened to some of the audios during the long hours at Harvest, I've got one more question, kind of like how Thunderbird 6 popped up later. So, he says, here it is. Some of the audio dramas have parts of the soundtracks included in the extras. Mm. First Action Bureau has almost all the soundtrack, barring a clean version of the opening titles and some classical music. And Operation Asteroids has a few of the incidental music tracks. I know this will be a niche, 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 niche suggestion, but will there ever be a soundtrack album released for the Andiverse audios, even if it's only <laughs> available in digital format? There's some of the music that I'd love to listen to, especially from the Captain Scarlet audios. Thanks for your time. Can't wait for Thunderbirds versus the Hood, though odds are I'll have it in my hands by the time you read this. Keep up the amazing work from James Munro. Thanks, James. You're right, that is a niche, 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 niche question. Yes, very niche, 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 niche. Uh, I don't think we do a standalone soundtrack. Uh, right. Never say never, but we do try yeah. where we can to fit these things in at the end of uh, recordings just so that you've got some extra material. We, don't, we can't always fit it in, that's the main thing. Sure. Not yeah. always possible to fit it in. So, um, yeah. Yeah, but I'll bear that in mind. I mean, Je- Benji Clifford's Captain Scarlet audio stuff is great, his music. Um, yes. And we did recently pull that so that we could use it for Anything Could Happen, mm-hmm. uh, the audio annual. So, yes, let's never say never. And yep. suggestion duly noted. And thank you for your feedback on Peril in Peru. That's actually a great set of observations and good to know. Yes, absolutely right. Uh, Mark and Kaz Lawson have got in touch about, uh, well, we were talking a couple of weeks ago about uh, Jerry's favourite snacks. Uh, it's probably one of the most uh, important <laughs> and very serious fab facts we've done. Uh, yes, uh, he says, uh, hi, Jamie, Richard and Chris, my wife and I, here's our favourite Jerry Anderson snacks, chocolate yogo, which is cold chocolate custard, on a Saturday morning watching an episode of Thunderbirds, a fun sort of tradition from early days in our married life. Oh. Uh, breakaway chocolate biscuits on breakaway day of in course. September of course P.S. Uh, in my younger days in the late 60s or early 70s our family used to buy takeaway dinner on Sunday evenings and we'd all sit down and watch Captain Scarlet isn't oh. that nice 
lovely family memory. Yeah, nice. Uh, so often people have got sort of very strong biographical yes. family memories of these things. It's the oh, absolutely as the nostalgia factor, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, Radio Gaga by Queen always reminds me of uh, strawberry milkshake and uh, caramel wafers and pepperami. There, because. <laughs> It used to be on Thursday nights on uh, Top of the Pops, and Thursday nights for my parents was mm-hmm. shopping night, and they'd come back ah. with treats. Oh, yeah. nice. Uh, oh, so thank you, Mark and Kaz. Uh, this is from Daryl Smith, who says, Dear Jamie, Richard and Chris, wanted to say a big thank you for being a constant positive in traumatic times. It's oh. so appreciated, and my heart lifts as each new pod opens. Here's a question. Are there any puppetry advancements, techniques or improvements that you would love to use in a series, including ones that are not used in the awesome Firestorm minisode? Maybe in a first Action Bureau series of some sort. Long may the podcast continue. Love and best wishes from Daryl. Hmm. Gosh. Interesting. Well, I mean, there's some, some interesting stuff we've seen recently in some testing with facial morphing. Right. Um, where obviously you can then increase the range of expression. The so more... you're applying CGI there to a, a puppet's face. You yes, think? essentially. But yeah. it's you know you're you're manipulating the physically filmed element, uh, mm-hmm. so it's not layering over digital stuff. It's just just morphing and modulating what's already been filmed. So it's quite it's quite an interesting technique, and it's quite subtle, yeah. but it yeah. can just increase the range of emotion. Because you know one of the things we tried so hard to do on the on the Firestorm pilot was to advance the puppets so they could emote more but the more yeah. you put in the head the more expensive they are the trickier they are to perform yeah. and you can you know you think how many muscles and stuff there are in the human face indeed trying to replicate yeah. that puppeteer is really tough and yet people expect stuff on screen to mm. emote a lot so it's very mm. tricky yeah but a good question uh, and finally for now Joe Etheridge says hello Jamie and Richard and hello. Chris I hope you're all well I uh, I wrote a couple of times in 2020 when I was expecting the birth of my twin girls and things since then well have been hectic busy I imagine <laughs> so, yes uh, I wanted to take the chance to say the new content being produced such as the concert and the Jerry Anderson documentary have been outstanding oh, merchy merch 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 FAB and as always the pod full of gubbins I have a recently <laughs> purchased a uh, copy of the Thunderbirds co-op card game and a few of my friends are eager to purchase a copy too with all the new audio dramas coming out and my lack of space for obvious reasons will you be looking to sell audio downloads at some point I love collecting physical content but I could no longer store it all so this will be a way to listen to the amazing new audio dramas and not miss out thanks again from joe ah yes now downloads Mm -hmm. are on our list of things which we're developing into the the store right Um, so we we have had downloads available for a while but they're a bit clunky so we're working on making that a bit smoother um and we hope to add downloadable versions uh in due course if you can't wait then for now you can still get them from bigfinish.com and after a month or two of being released, uh, Big Finish then do further distribution to Audible and other platforms. So oh, if you are an Audible listener, you can listen to most of the stuff there. Um, and if not and you can't wait, then bigfinish.com. But if you can wait and would like to buy it directly from us and download it from your Jerry Anson store account, then probably before the end of the year. How's that? Oh, wonderful. Great. Very Mm. good. Uh, So there we are. That's all for now. But uh, if you'd like me to read out your email in the next edition of the Jerry Anderson podcast, it's very easy. Simply fire it off to podcast at jerryanderson.com. And Richard reads them all. Yeah, I do. Pretty much. Yeah, Yeah, I do. It's amazing. I love the fact that we get this sort of continual stream of interaction. So thank you for emailing in, Pastorons. Now, can I adorn you with some Jerry Anderson news? (laughs) Okay, what's that going to look like? I don't you know. You're going to put something on me? Have you got a Jerry Anderson news hat or something? Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, I'll find one for you. Uh, right. Anyway, it's time for the Jerry Anderson news. It is some Jerry Anderson news. Newsy, news, news, news. news. Yeah. Oh, really? it fits perfectly, by the way. Look at that. Your news hat. It doesn't even fall down over my ears. Very, yeah, it's very nice, fetching. Yeah, you look great. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, oh, Richard, what's that over there? 
What? Where? It's a Fireball XL5 book incoming. Oh, what? Ooh. Fireball XL5? Yes, Fireball XL5. Well, this month is the 60th anniversary of the show's first transmission on the 28th of October at, I think it was 7pm, so quite late. Way back in 1962, it was the first episode, Planet 46, which was broadcast in the UK. And mm-hmm. now, 60 years on, we're releasing Fireball XL5 60th anniversary edition of a comic anthology featuring all the strips from TV21 and new linking material from comic artist Lee Sullivan. Nice. And I can tell you that that linking material is very cool indeed, and Lee had a lot of fun doing it. Now, hopefully by the time you hear this, we will have done a little uh, live stream or put out some sort of video last week about that, so you'll know more or you can find out more about it. If not, then it'll be on the Jerry Anson website, jerryanson.com. But it's very exciting. Uh, more information coming in the next couple of weeks and you'll be able to pre-order it later in the month there will be a special edition signed and numbered by Lee Sullivan and some other bloke uh, called Jamie Anderson I think no um, never heard of oh the, uh, the snowboarder oh that's it yeah oh god Olympic <laughs> snowboarder yeah she's brilliant uh, that's it uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and standard editions available as well. It's a real beauty. So much Mike Noble art, uh, so much Lee Sullivan art. It's just a gorgeous collection and crosses into the world uh, of Stingray and Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds. So it's, yeah, it's a lovely thing. So I hope you nice. enjoy that. Uh, yeah. Obviously, Halloween is on the way as well. And you may have seen Chris Dale's rather marvellous selection of proposed characters for dress up for Halloween. Um, <laughs> right. Of course, including. The beautiful Zelda from Terror Hawks. Uh, and if you want to ease your way into that costume, then you can get a Zelda mask from the Jerry Anderson store in time for Halloween. They are absolutely terrifying. <laughs> they're just hideous, uh, but in Great. the way they're intended to be. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, now, you already mentioned the Thunderbirds Day live stream we had. Yes! 30th of September has been and gone. I can't believe we're already in the last quarter of the year, but there we are. Mm. Uh, You may have seen that live stream. We've released the Thunderbirds calendar for 2023, as well as five new Thunderbirds designs uh, on T-shirts of the Tracy Brothers and their vehicles. They are Thunderbirds Day limited edition specials and will only be available until the end of this month, the 31st of October. So do pop along and grab those. We've also mentioned uh, in this earlier on, I think, about Thunderbirds versus the Hood and the audio annual Anything Can Happen, which are in stock and shipping now uh, and starting to get some rather lovely reviews. Mm -hmm. And finally, by popular demand, lots of you have been asking for the Commander Koenig cosplay t-shirt to come back in stock. Well, we've ordered some more for you. They're arriving in stock next week. Uh, If they arrive earlier and you've already been onto the site and clicked uh, notify me when back in stock, then you'll get an automated email when they arrive. So there you go. Clever. Yes, lots of stuff going on. There's loads more, but I thought I'd do a nice quick canter through that. And I've now Mm. finished cantering. So that's the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news, cantering news. <laughs> I think it sound, makes it sound a bit like a horse podcast, doesn't it? Yeah. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> the Jerry Anson horsecast. Yeah. <laughs> Which does sound pretty amazing, I have to say. <laughs> let's, not, let's not transition oh, to that. We don't think we need to yet. All right. Meanwhile, over on our Facebook group, uh, people have been joining in the fun. Of course, I particularly have enjoyed Roger Smith's uh, latest cosplay. He went to a convention dressed as uh, Father Unwin from the Secret Service. Is that just a vicar oh, yes. outfit? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. He made a little, uh, you know, the, 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 the tape recorder type thing minimizer uh, the, the earphone that's the one <laughs> the minimizer yeah uh so yes uh also people have been posting uh, their latest merch and comments and reviews hugh porter says uh this is after learning that his pre-ordered stingray soundtrack is on its way stingray stingray after a good three years of waiting it's finally here my heart just melted over the excitement of one of the best composed music from barry gray ah oh, yes nice. it is rather uh, special Rob Doyle has found something rather interesting. He's found uh, the Space 1999 book Aftershock and Awe. Mm. And he says, I've been trying to get this for a while without paying a fortune. It arrived today in great condition and it only cost me the original cover price. That's Result. not bad, is it? Well done. Yeah. Uh, Gary Hodgkinson says the new artwork on the podcast gets a yay vote from me. Oh, great. Thank you That's very good. much. I'm, I'm not sure we did put it to the vote, though, did we? Uh, no, we it, just, going? It, no. It, it just went up. Yeah. So. Thank you. <laughs> 
James Monroe again says, late to the party, but I've listened to the latest podcast now. Thanks for sharing the snippet from The Vanishing Ray. Uh, it was really touching <laughs> to hear that the new Thunderbirds audio will be dedicated to Matt Zimmerman. And the audio itself is sounding great. Fun to hear how you've modified the story. But between what happens to Brains in this one and the title of the second episode, I'm feeling really sorry for poor Brains in this album. Also fun that we got some Lavender Castle just after Jamie and Simpsons clips had a little debate on just how kiddie the kids show is. As if to drive the point home, what shall we do with the crew of the paradox? What shall we do with the crew of the paradox? What shall we do with the crew of the paradox? They'll be dead by morning. You wouldn't get many kids shows using the D word these days. You would James. not. You're right, James. Uh, also, people have been commenting about our, it's sort of an occasional uh, item, seeing Anderson things in strange places. Uh, Clive Very Lewis, title that. <laughs> isn't it? Uh, Clive Lewis saw, uh, I think it was a shop front for SIG Roofing, uh, and says, looks like Colonel White has a sideline in the roofing business. <laughs> <laughs> could happen. Richard Crane posted a YouTube clip and says, does anyone growing up in the 1990s remember seeing this? Uh, and it's a clip from the Children's Royal Variety performance, a scene from The Adventure of a Lifetime in 1993 in which Brains lands Thunderbird 1 vertically to rescue Billy Jones, Indiana Jones's brother, inside a pyramid, but he proves himself to be very useless, so he calls Lady Penelope and Parker to help instead. Mm. Wow. Sounds like a cheese dream, doesn't it? <laughs> But, you know, take yes, his word for it. Yes, best kind of dreams. Yeah. Uh, and finally, Tom Hodden uh, did do a poll. Which Andiverse franchise would make the best role-playing game campaign? Ooh. So he put it out to the vote. Uh, in last place, Stingray and Lavender Castle with 2%. Space 1999 at 8%. UFO at 13%. Thunderbirds at 29%. Captain Scarlet at yes. 37%. I'm not surprised Scarlet got really? there. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. It's just it, because of the the whole setup with the Mistrons and the query over why and how we went to war and the agents and stuff. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's very interesting. Mm. Okay, mm. there you go. Mm. Okay, so if you're a, a member of Facebook, then why not join the uh, official listeners th Facebook group? <laughs> f -f 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 Facebook. <laughs> Easy yeah, to say. Yeah. I'm not going to go back and do that again. Uh, oh. Just go to <laughs> facebookcom forward slash groups forward slash Podstrons and join in the fun. Please do. Yeah, the nicest place on the internet. It really is. As we say. Would you like some more interviewee stuff, Richard James? Because I mean, oh, whether yes. you like it or not, you're still getting it. Great. Is it Chris Bentley? It is Chris Bentley. He's back for part wow. three of four. Come on, uh, I mean, nice. all of you must know who he is by now. And uh, you know now also that Stingray saved his life. Yeah. Uh, he's, he is a longtime fan and expert in all things Anderson, as you know, including um, he's written loads of books like Space 1999, The Vault. The most recent one, Captain Scarlet, The Vault. Thunderbirds, The Vault and the complete book of Thunderbirds and the complete book of UFO and a bunch of other stuff too even some non-Anderson things uh, and he's a very nice guy and uh, he uh, chatted to me from uh, close proximity to his decanter so yes. here now <laughs> is Chris Bentley part three so uh, just because you have you've delved into these worlds repeatedly and you know you've looked at the history the making of the episodes the characters you know, forensically over decades, really, Chris, I'm not expecting mm. you to come up with the precise formula, but are there any elements that you think, particularly maybe undercredited elements of the the process, the timing, the people, the inspiration that really did make it work? Hmm. Undoubtedly, the things I think that that grab people's attention and imagination that fi fire the imagination of kids in particular uh you know it isn't it isn't really you know relationships between characters or or you know, or even interesting characters particularly uh if characters are funny that gets kids attention and of course that's why parker is such a popular character i think with with uh, yeah. with children in thunderbirds and that relationship between parker and penelope um, that's there because it's you know it's it's funny. Mm -hmm. The other than that, you know the 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 boys are heroes. The you know the Tracy brothers, you know they're they're like older old boys that young boys can look up to and idolize and hero heroize. But apart from that, really, it's it's I think it's it's the <laughs> yeah. vehicles. You know the imaginative use of vehicles. I mean it's. 
I, th- I think these days perhaps it would be considered or it is considered sexist to stereotype boys as only being interested in you know in machinery cars and machinery uh, and, uh, and war and things like that but you know it's it, we're wired like that that's that's how it that's just how it is and uh, I think you know for for young children young boys watching programs like Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds the fact that the people that worked for your father had come up with mm. these fantastic designs and he'd developed these ideas where, you know, I mean, Thunderbird 2, it's just <laughs> genius, isn't it, really, to have a vehicle that, in all, to all intents and purposes, doesn't do anything except ferry <laughs> other vehicles around. I mean, occasionally it gets a yeah. bit of heavy lifting, doesn't it? But the genius of it is that it's you've got this thing, to, it, uh, it's great big... <clears throat> Blooming uh, aircraft turns up somewhere, and it lifts up its pod, and you're waiting. You're waiting to see what's going to emerge, what's going to come out of that pod that is going to save the day. And uh, and I mean, a, a lot of the time it's just the mole, <laughs> but a, other times, uh, you know, all sorts of other you know interesting yeah. things pop out. And uh, you know, that's th- those kind of things that that, uh, that fire kids' imagination. Uh, what you know really what what makes you makes yeah. your father's show work works father's shows work um in the way that they do and when that doesn't happen when those things don't come together like with the secret service uh which for all that you know as a character piece you know with, with ideas and plotting and you know the idea of the miniaturization and and father unwin talking is gobbledygook is a lovely charming show it's you know uh, really production wise it's it's you know one of your father's best but in terms of firing the imagination of kids you can understand why <laughs> why uh you know it didn't uh, it didn't fly yeah. and Lou grade was sadly i have to say i agree with him that it was it was the right right decision to nip that yeah. in the bud particularly as it meant that Jerry got to go on and make yeah, UFO instead. exactly. I think it, I, well, I, I always have a theory, Chris, and you feel free to disagree with me, but there, I think subconsciously there was a bit of a, almost a self-destructive approach to the creation of the Secret Service because you've, you've got the, the desperate attempt to move into live action and what, what live action could bring with that hybrid approach with, I'm always minded of the, um, mm. Uh, the man in a red coat with a silver wig getting onto a motorbike and riding off in the Secret Service and how clunky and awful it looked. So <laughs> it's the kind of last gasp of, I really want to get rid of it. I'm going to edge the puppets out as much as I can and move here. And to do something which clearly was, uh, you know, at best a risk and at worst just, you know, crazy. Mm. So, uh, so I, I wonder how much of him was kind of, you know, mm. fed up with it. And there's a bit of a not that'll do attitude because because like you say, it's it is beautiful. But it feels like he was kind of it was mm. the, the, the I must escape from this world show of, of the, the 60s. It's it is a sort of a hybrid, isn't it? You can clearly see, as you say, it's the, the it's almost as if there seems to be an attempt there to prove to Lou mm. Grade, if to nobody else, that he could make a yeah. show in live action, which you know clearly it did because the next thing Lou asked him to do was a live action show. So it worked. So it, if that was if that was what if that was what your <laughs> father had in mind, it worked. But you know that's that, that's not to say that the show itself wasn't you know still you can mm. see it being a process of 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 your father tr- yes. trying to do something different. Not sitting on his laurels and just making another another Thunderbirds, not uh, you know, uh, and moving on from having done Joe ninety. What what will work? What is the current thing? Well, it's you know spy shows and spy films. So you know, in, the, in a, Joe ninety was a, a step in that direction. Uh, what's different? Well, we have a, have a nine year old kid who's a spy, and we were still in that kind of mentality in in the late sixties, and uh, so. The idea of having a uh, having Stanley Unwin as a, uh, a priest who was a spy, uh, with a with a gardener that he could miniaturize, you know, it was obviously just you know an attempt to do something different and going in a completely different direction, 
to what had gone before so that it wasn't yeah. competing with his other shows which were still being the, repeated. The incredibly smooth transition um, from a nine-year-old boy but, you know, who could be a spy to a 60-year-old priest, priest who was a spy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's odd, isn't it, as a, as a juxtaposition of the two? Yeah, and it clearly show. I mean, it wouldn't obviously it wouldn't fly today because it'd get killed at the at the you know the first first you know at the pitch meeting that you know people would turn around and say what appeal what appeal yes. has this Jerry got to you know little kids and uh, and Jerry I'm sure would have had to admit <laughs> that it had very little appeal but yeah he was he was trying to do something different and uh, and. And push his yeah. technology as well, of trying to create puppets that were as 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 yeah. human like, you know, as possible to the extent of creating a puppet that looked like an actual person, and and then combining that with footage yeah. of the real person, uh, and seeing yeah. if that works. I mean, it's, it's another part of that pioneering approach um, to everything, isn't it? Um, I mean, I, from your point of view, Chris, do you do you know what? Or do you have an, any idea what drove him? To, to be constantly pushing ahead, ahead, ahead in terms of, well, realism, I'm sure we can find, find reasons for, but always pushing for the next technical advance. Because there'd be a lot of people out, out in the, the world of film and TV who would go, well, this is how we do things. And you sort of cookie cutter it uh, from series to series and the industry moves on and you move with it. But he wasn't moving on with the industry. He was, he was moving the industry uh together with the team so what what drove him to do that do you think yeah that's a that's a good question i'd hesitate really to to want to give an opinion if there was sort of like anything in his in his childhood or or growing up or or anything i think it's just the the uh the, the man's imagination really always wanting to yeah, to progress and to make a to make a mark and to make his program mm. something that wasn't just run of the mill, yeah. um, the norm. You know, why did a program have Jerry Anderson's name on it? Because it was something different and innovative, and it, you know, it wasn't just another, you know, ITV, ITC show uh, like The Saint or The Baron or Danger Man or whatever. You, you, where. Yeah, they none of those were really sort of pushing the technology, or the, uh, the you know they were kind of like just following the crowd and giving giving the public what they wanted. It would be interesting if 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 at the time that that your father really wanted to make the move to live action, which I would guess was was uh, you know even as early as Stingray and Thunderbirds, uh, you know, I think he would have he really would have preferred Lou to have said. You know, I'll give you three times as much money and do the show in live action. Um, it would be interesting to see what he would have done if he still would have, you know, pushed the boundaries in 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 that way. I mean, he obviously did with UFO. Perhaps not so much with the Protectors. So the Protectors, I guess, is a sort of an, an example of of an ITC, one of those ITC shows that Jerry would have ended up mm. making. Yeah, I don't well, know where I'm going I was with say this, the, Jamie. It's, the protectors it's isn't, wasn't his baby, what, was it? What, what was, what was but, driving I mean, I, him? I think mm. you, you have hit upon something there, I think, which is that a lot of people's in, uh, imagination and innovation stays in the fictional world and on, on screen that way. But his imagination and innovation crossed from the fictional to the making of, to the behind the scenes. So it was always imagining a better future behind the scenes and in front of the camera. You see what I mean? So it sort of spilled across both to the benefit of viewers and the end product and, and the industry. And I, I don't know why, why that was that he ended up applying it to both, but that to me seems to be part of the secret. I think maybe some of it comes down to what you also, what you were saying earlier, Jamie, about, about the, the, your father not never being satisfied with the, mm. with the things that he made perhaps not being able to judge their their value to other people that if he was given some money to make a puppet show when really what he wanted to make was live action films he had that he had that drive in him to want to make the best puppet show he didn't just want to make any puppet show he didn't just want to make the wooden tops or andy pandy he wanted his his product to stand out uh from the rest 
as a way of proving himself, I suppose, uh, in the in the entertainment industry, of proving that you know his his company and his his people had the talent and the ability and the innov- innovation to produce something that was a cut above the rest. And if that involved developing new technology to make that work, that was his mm. that was his drive, and all the way down the line, I suppose, yeah. it's just his his feeling that if he was being made. If if he was making a television show, it he wanted it to to be he wanted it to be better than uh, and, and yeah than, than than what else was yeah was, than everybody was around else's and than his last thing you're only as good as your last show or your last performance I guess is the the view there I mean you, you mm. withdrew from commenting on yeah. childhood drivers and yeah. what might have you know I, I'm not, not going to push you for pop psychology don't worry. Uh, I'm more than happy to attempt that myself from time to time. But did he ever talk to you about his childhood or his his brother? Because again, it's something Lionel is is a figure that loomed large, but he spoke about him to varying degrees depending on the person. Did, did you ever hear anything about his childhood? Um, no, I have to say we didn't uh, we didn't really we didn't really talk about those sorts of things. I mean, he, you know, he did mention, he would mention it, you know, from time to time. Um, sometimes with relation to the reason why something or someone appeared mm. in a, you know, in a program. I remember having a, having a conversation with him at one point where he was, he was really quite agitated about the idea that the character of Phones had been given a name in Stingray, not on screen. Uh, obviously not in in mm. uh, in any of the scripts or anything, but uh, but in TV in TV twenty one and you know associated uh, tie in material that other people had come up with a name <laughs> for phones, and he would he, he, he you know he was really quite annoyed about it <laughs> really. <laughs> I, I mean, you can understand. I suppose you know it hadn't come from him. He hadn't given the character a name. But it, but what it was was he'd very specifically not given the character a name other than phones because uh, of his background in uh, you know in the in the control tower and yeah. at RAF Manston, where the you know the guy the guy with the headphones was called phones and nobody else <laughs> nobody knew what his name was. You know that was just they, they would. Yeah. Nicknames that people were given, and and that was like you know across the board in the, you know in the RAF and services that somebody somebody who wore headphones for a living was called phones, and that was the concept of the character, as far as your father was concerned, and it was really rather disturbing to him that people had decided to to go beyond yeah. that and give him a real name. So yeah, it was sort of the you know those kind of things, and and uh, the appearance of of the of the uh, of, of the airport RAF Manston uh, in the first episode mm. of Joe Ninety, I think it is, was you know a direct call back to you know his his time in the in the RAF. So we talk about those things uh, yeah. where it was relevant um, to my understanding of why things were done in programs, but we didn't really talk about didn't really talk about his childhood, the first and and you know his growing up and so on, and a lot of the first I knew of any of that really was when Simon Archer wrote mm. his or biography in, well, that was mid nineties, was, yeah. wasn't yeah. it? I think thereabout. I mean, just mm. I'm interested now you've mentioned the biography and it's interesting again, hearing how, what, what he, what he spoke to you about, you know, cause some people he would speak about Lionel, for example, or about his upbringing, you know, bit, bits and pieces throughout his life. From my point of view, he was quite, he wanted to keep quite tight control over what was told about him. And so I wonder what your view is yeah. of that first Simon Archer biography, not from Simon's writing, but from any impression you got from the way it was written and the way things were perhaps contracted or redacted, what what that said about him as a as a person no uh again it wasn't really wasn't something we particularly spoke about uh you know the the book was there you know Mm. i i read it your father never asked me (laughs) for my opinion of it or or uh or or anything they yeah 
my only involvement really was uh, art directing ah, the cover. And a very for the nice book. cover it is too. Uh, but I designed the, the uh, yeah, I designed this idea of, of having uh, having Jerry standing in front of Thunderbird two, and uh, I thought it would be nice to show Thunderbird two against the night sky because you usually see it uh, against against daytime. Yeah. You know, blue sky with clouds and so on. I thought, well, if we have a if we have a night a night sky, we can also have a nice big explosion <laughs> in the background. And so those are the sort of like two things that people think yeah. of when they think of Jerry Anderson is Thunderbird two and a big explosion. So so yeah, so we went uh we went down to your house and uh and set up a sort of like a little photographic yeah. studio in the uh in the shed. And um Took some took some very nice pictures of your father in a in his favourite yes. green shirt. <laughs> I know the one. And uh, and then he then he pulls <laughs> he pulls some strings. Yeah, he pulls some strings down at um, Shepherd and Studios with the uh, the the effects team that were making Space Precinct, and got them to do the uh, do them do the uh, ah. the digital composition. Um, I think they uh, yeah they they. I think the, the explosion must have come from yeah. Space Precinct. They found that and used that and uh, and uh, did some did some very nice work mm. on the model of Thunderbird Two that was photographed. That was yep. Richard Gregory's Thunderbird Two, and uh, it had had a big section cut out of it for a, an advert. And so the people at um, yeah the camera company that's I think right I think. The name of the name of the company. Uh, that was doing the effects on Space Precinct. They digitally recreated the the, the bottom of Thunderbird Two to fill in the hole, and did a did a fantastic job on it. Created a you know very nice yeah. composite image uh, for us of the uh, of uh, of Jerry with the uh, with the vehicle, and it's it's gone on and appeared. I think it's been used in a number of other applications. Uh, I think they've uh, got hold of it and used it in magazines and things when the when the printed. Interviews. Well, it's it's, it's a great image. I've got uh, there's a copy of it right behind me so here. Was, yeah, quite quite so, pleased uh, with that. <laughs> oh yeah, I think he yeah. was quite quite proud of that. Yeah, it mm. works. It worked very nicely. Well, that's lovely. Yeah. I did. I didn't realise that that was yeah. uh, that was you. But that was yeah, yeah. That was my uh, that was my only involvement really mm. with the with the book. Oh uh, yeah, I did see I did see a, a draft of it. Um, Jerry asked me to have a have a, a look through it for factual errors uh, to do with yeah. the making of the program and so on. Uh, various programs, mostly it was like you know dates and sequence of events and so on. Um, that uh, that uh, yeah. that he asked me to pick up on. Um, but yeah, obviously all the all the material about his early life, I had no no mm-hmm. knowledge of it at all. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't correct any of that. Right, so that was pretty fresh to you then. <laughs> So um, yeah, and we didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all absolutely fresh. Uh, yeah, I mean, was, I, had, I had no idea about his uh, his, uh, his Jewish background and the you know the reasons why his parents fled uh, Germany and uh, came over here, and uh, yeah, his early upbringing and so on. Um, that was all. That was all very new to me. But we didn't talk about it. It was. I think probably because of my position as as mm. you know the club chairman, um, things were generally only really our discussions were you know with it just within the context yeah. of you just the talk programs, shop. Really. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's yeah, totally that's... fair. That's totally fair, Chris. <laughs> Understandable. One more Chris Bentley to go uh, in, in next week. I was going to say very shortly. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell you exactly when. I can. <laughs> It'll be next week. Um, yes. So, yes, what a nice chat with Chris. I hope you're learning all sorts of stuff about how he came to the, the world of Anderson, his thoughts and reflections and all that sort of stuff. But I really enjoyed our chat. And we could have actually gone on for another hour. But thankfully, uh, probably for him and his day, we didn't. So <laughs> just one more part for you next week. Great. Look forward to it. And I know our lovely podstrons have been enjoying it because over on YouTube, they've been commenting Beneath Pod 224. Ian Dealey, for example, says, uh, I'm so glad that you finally got Chris Bentley as a podcast guest. I've got most of his books, including three versions of The Complete Jerry Anderson, Captain Scarlet, The Vault, and, of course, The Complete Book of Thunderbirds. Mm. Nice. 
Uh, Eston Dunn said, huge fan of Chris and the podcast. Great to hear and to get updates. Uh, we also spoke in that pod, I think, about uh, an unmade episode of uh, UFO. Well, that was a few pods ago, yes. It was, wasn't it? Uh, GMLPC commented, apparently unfilmed scripts are very rare in TV or film because writers only get the go-ahead to do a full script if the producers have definitely decided to make it. More common might be story outlines where someone trying to get commission for a script will submit their idea. Some of these won't get the go-ahead because they'd be too expensive or difficult to produce, don't fit with the format, or don't seem so interesting, or might be very good, but there are already enough scripts ready to go. I suppose many of these outlines will have long disappeared, but there might still be some around, and it would be interesting to read them or even have them produced in some way. Hmm. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> well, if you want to read some unmade episode stories... And you can mm-hmm. pre-order maybe there, The Lost Stories from Space 1999. Uh-huh. Of course, which yes. we've got uh, coming out next month. And Excellent. that does contain one unmade episode of Space 1999, plus uh, novelizations based on you know drafts that were subsequently yeah. changed quite significantly, particularly for the, uh, for the opening episode. So mm. they are around in various they places. Are. And wouldn't it be interesting to find every submitted script from every writer to the Jerry Anderson show <laughs> because there must have been people who just sent stuff in you know on spec as it were oh goodness me. Yeah, fun, we get we it? get stuff sent all, in all the time so I'm sure yeah yeah they, they sure got stuff sent yeah. in time too Cup and Scarlet yes Cup yes. and Scarlet Cup and Scarlet CPN Scarlet says <laughs> uh, favourite scene of all the Jerry Anderson universe ah yes this is something again we were asking a few weeks ago tough uh, how about a list number one Maya, in a feverish state, starting an eagle's engines inside one of Alpha's hangars. Two, the technicians being blown out of a damaged launch pad airlock in War Games. Three, any launch sequence from Thunderbirds I Go, CGI series. Or four, sky launch from UFO. Five, Fireball XL5 launch. Or six, Stingray launch. I could go on. Oh, a lot of launchy yes. stuff there. Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Launches okay. are cool, that's why. Yeah, and very quickly, people have been commenting under our fab fact uh, of a few weeks ago. Did Jerry Anderson refuse a space flight? Uh, Frank Berry says, I have to say that the idea of having models of XL5 and Thunderbird 3 in geostationary orbit over Pinewood does appeal. Yeah, (laughs) very specific. (laughs) It is. Ian Dealey said, I would very much like to see Jamie Anderson, Richard James and Chris Dale get an invitation to go into space. That would be epic. It certainly yeah. would be. I don't know who's going to invite us to. That. I mean, I'm sure there's some people who would like to fire us uh, out of the Earth's yes, orbit, but I, into the sun. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who wants to invite us on a on a trip with a return leg. Um, I don't think. Uh, I don't think I could do it. I'm not very good with heights at the best of times. <laughs> it doesn't appeal to me. I must say. Does not. No. Could you do it? Uh, I'd be terrified because the the kind yeah. of the, the exterior vastness and void of space it does yeah. frighten me, but also um, just amazing, an amazing thing to, to do. Yeah, um, sure. So yeah. May, maybe I mean I doubt I'm going to get get the opportunity, but um, it's a nice idea. Yes. Uh, and finally, O. D. Dylan. Now I like it when people um, take Jamie to task. Uh, oh. so it's, uh, Jamie, Voyager One was the satellite with the gold disc that uh, bore your dad's name. Yes, I remember. Thank you. You're right. There you go. Yeah, uh, all for now. But yes, there's lots to see on the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel, including the podcast, but also various other features. Uh, oh gosh, uh, have a look at the primers. That's a good place to start if you're new to all this, or just want to have your memory refreshed of uh, previous Jerry Anderson productions, and uh, go from there. You'll spend days and days on that channel. I'll warn you now. It, yes, unfortunately, you, you probably will be stuck there for some time, mm. but you'll you'll enjoy it, so it'll be fine. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, mm. Very good. Any more? Or would you no, uh, do for now. like to move on to the listener's favourite part of this podcast? Oh, yeah. The end. No, the, the randomizer. Hey! Oh, I'm joking. <laughs> I've said that before. It's the randomizer, hosted by Brandon Meister himself, Chris Dale. He'll pop along any second and either press the red button himself, get somebody else to, we'll find some other way <laughs> of picking a random Jerry Anderson episode. You see, I've been taken to task, so I have to get this right. You now. have. Yes. Very good. You're learning. Uh, yes. Uh, anyway, he does that. And says some stuff about an episode. Uh, so here is, without further ado, the randomizer. Now you listen to me! He's not the Messiah! He's a very naughty robot! Now go away! Now watch Space 1999! 
We're watching Brian the Brain. Yes, watching Brian the Brain. Not written by a genius, but someone insane. Actually, it was written by a chap called Jack Ronda, who I best know for writing uh, a lot of Survivors episodes. Journey. We've kept a full record of everything that has happened. Anyway, welcome back to Space 1999 Series 2. Have we been here this year? I don't think so. Can't remember. Anyway, memory banks. The Alphans are busy Computer is fully engaged. reviewing, well, they say old memory tapes, Scientific person. but in fact, it just looks like, again, pages from an encyclopedia. That does. What's the matter, John? Don't you like having an easy time? Oh, I'd like it much better if uh, my off-duty time coincided with yours. Mm, romantic banter, romantic banter, flirting, head tilting. Well, maybe the computer will pick out some memories of us together. Then we can uh, learn from the past. I'd rather get back to the prison. Because I don't care about... Who's that? Victor Bergman? I don't remember him. David Cano? Doesn't ring a bell. Ah. Change. 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 The word change has appeared on the screen. That's Ooh. not from the memory track. Oh, that's happening now. I love how completely, um... How completely clueless they are about what's happening, considering what it turns out is something fairly major, and the computer should be screaming at them that the moon is changing course. It's happened many times before, but instead they're like, "What? What's this mean?" We're changing course. What? The moon can't be off course. That's impossible. This is impossible. It's impossible. It's never happened before. Yes, they're reacting as this is this as this, this is a com as this as, as as if this is a completely new thing. It's too early for me to go completely to pieces, especially when watching Brand the Brain. We must remain sensible for Brand the Brain. So. What are we looking for? It looks the same as it always does. It's big and black and it's got a lot of stars in it. And that's my expert opinion on space. I'm Tony Vadeshi. The computer's still reviewing the memory tracks. Cancel the review. It was a silly bit of pointless banter creating thing for the start of the episode. We don't need it now. Yes, everything's getting a bit more serious now. Come on. I want to know what's pulling us off course. I do love Martin Landau pacing and clicking his fingers. It's he's very good. He's very good at pacing his Landau. Yasko, I want a 360 degree visual scan. Uh-huh. Well, she was already doing that. Very slowly, but she was doing it. But there's nothing. Nobody can see anything out there that might be pulling the moon off course. Nothing. Could be a black dwarf. Uh-oh. A collision course with a black dwarf. Right, only one thing to do. Panic! Evacuation procedure. Again, we've had black suns in the first season. Black suns specifically, not black holes. All eagles, prepare to... So I don't quite understand what the show thinks a black dwarf might be. I mean, I freely admit I don't really either. I, I kind of assume they're all one and the same thing. We're getting closer to whatever's pulling us. And we don't have much time. No. Evacuate! And here's something I love. I think I've mentioned it before. But I love when, and it's in this, it's in UFO, it's in a new Captain Scarlet, and I think that might be it for, for Anderson stuff. Maybe Space Precinct, where they give the order to evacuate. Evacuate, and you know what that means. Stock footage, and people running around in corridors. Of course, it's extras. It's nobody you recognise aside from you know, being extras. There's Pam Rose, there's Glenda Allen. Stock footage of travel tubes and eagles, but... It, I just find it so much fun. I hope I'm not the only one who, who really loves a good evacuation scene. I expect I am, though. And I love watching the extras, particularly what, watching what they are holding, what's been judged important enough to, to take off of Alpha, little boxes and things. So everyone's in command centre, and so is an extra by the name of Annie Lambert, who we may have discussed before because she was in New Adam, New Eve. Uh, she was in a few episodes around this time, got some dialogue in the second series. Oh, she'd done a couple of episodes in the first season, too. Estimates only what? And she uh, later turned up in Doctor Who in, in Fort of Doomsday. She was one of the frog aliens in that. I calculate that's a small planet with no more gravity pull than we have. So she picked up a, a bit more work than just extra. Just a magnify. We have something coming towards the base now. Oh, is this spaceship? Wait a minute. There we go, wait a minute. Oh. Oh. Intercept. Oh, this is reminding me. We we have been to Series 2 this year, haven't we? We were there for the Bringers of Wonder back in March, where the base was visited by a Super Swift. 
So, what a coincidence that the next time we return to Series 2... Eagle 1 to Moonbase, we have visual. They are about to be welcomed by a Swift, presumably a forerunner of the same spaceship. Sonic Eagle 1, are you having abnormal gravity from that spaceship? No, sir, gravity is normal. Hmm. So, no abnormal gravity from the spaceship, whatever that means. Eagle 1 to Eagle 2, angle 10 degrees from me. And we don't have Alan Carter in charge of the Eagles this week. Don't know where he is, we've got Bill Fraser instead. Eagle 1 to Spaceship who's uh, always a, a solid, reliable, dependable chap. Eagle One to Spaceship, can you receive me? We are friendly. And this is really his um, his sort of reintroduction to the series. He'd been in the first episode, and after that he'd been... He'd just almost been an extra in the Tabor on the Mark of Arcanon. Now, th- I think this is his first real attempt at establishing this guy as a... a regular... Eagle One to Spaceship. I would almost say important part of the show. Self. But I probably I probably mean important in the sense that John Hug is important to the show because they know they can just chuck him in whenever one of the regulars isn't there, rather than Bill Fraser himself as a character. Anyway, speaking of characters... Let's try to check that out. I've waffled all over the introduction of our title character. After all, the episode is not called Bill Fraser, it's called Brian the Brain. It's Mothership and Four Swifts under Captain Michael. Captain Michael. I love the way, I love the way Maya says Captain. She doesn't say Captain, she says Captain. Communications break. Fate unknown. So, it's another failed Earth expedition into space. There used to be a base on the moon. What was it? Uh, Alpha. Because I don't know, how how many failed missions is that? Moon base Alpha is operational. In the 1999 universe. In, in fact, how many how many missions succeeded? That's the that's the uh, the smaller number, surely. Gravity threat or fuck? And of course, that voice. We all know that voice. Alpha. Well, particularly if you're uh, if you're a resident of the British Isles, but I'm sure certain people further afield will recognise the voice of Bernard Cribbins, the much loved, much missed. Stop at a Swift. All right, come on down and have lunch with us. Grandpa of the country. If you don't know, he was well known for for sort of light entertainment, some comedy, but really children's and family shows and films. This applies to missiles standing by for evacuation. Narration on various children's shows, in particular the Wombles, and uh, I think he held the record for the most appearances on Jack and Nori, which again, if you don't know, was uh, again a children's show where celebrities would come on and just read stories to children. And uh, Bernard Cribbins just, oh. Eagles remain on standby. We love Bernard Cribbins. It's like just when he died, and he, he only died a few months ago, so it's quite appropriate that Brian the Brain should turn up this year. Yeah, oh, just a national outpouring of grief, because he was just impossible not to love. Uh, I think for some people, though, this episode kind of pushes that a bit. Uh, certainly not me, I, I although the character is quite uh, grating at times. I think the fact that it's Cribbins... Bernard National Treasure Cribbins forgives quite a few sins of this episode. So, having gone from a potentially hostile situation, we've now got this uh, swift spaceship has landed at Alpha, and uh, the pilot wants to have lunch with them. I also like that the boarding tube was extending towards the swift, and it's clear that the boarding tube model is not going to link to that model spaceship, the the shapes are just incompatible. So they're they're extending the walkway really slowly. And anyway, Koenig and Helena and two security guards, Alpha. Quentin Pierre and Mark Zuba, are coming aboard. And of course, Quentin Pierre was uh, well was in most episodes of both seasons. Mark Zuba had only I think been in one episode before this, and that was Black Sun. Uh, he's just hanging around in several scenes of Black Sun. He was also in The Protectors, uh, an episode we did not too long ago, called With a Little Help from My Friends. And they're checking out this whole ship. Doesn't seem to be anything of note. I mean, there's a huge computer panel there with a big smiley face. But aside from that... There's no one there, sir. What? Just no sign of anyone. No flesh-eating octopus or anything? You're security guards, damn it. I send you in first to get eaten or burnt or whatever. That's right, Doctor. Okay, fellas. Okay, okay. You've had your inspection. And I, I like how quickly, actually, Quentin Pierre and Mark Zuber are like, Oh, we've got to get our guns back out. This is serious. He tricked us. Definitely someone there. Where are you? 
They both look quite tough in this scene. I suppose it helps that they've got the huge rocket launchers rather than the uh, staple guns. No, 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 you stay there, okay? I'll come and meet you. And there he is, that uh, obvious robot that wasn't really fitting in with the main command deck because it had a smiley face for one reason, is actually mobile. Morning. Yeah, that's me. This is our guest character, Brian the Brain. And you're the lady. Voiced by Bernard Cribbins. I'm Dr. Russell. Well, how are you, Dr. Russell? Being a bit... I think I get the, the impression he's ad-libbing at points during this. Um, keynote, he has also got basically a tail. It's a cable running out of his um, his bottom. That is going to be important in the story, believe it or not. Oh, there aren't any steps or stairs, are there? No. Because I'm on wheels and I can't cope with the bumps. They didn't think of that when they made... Oh, there we go. Canonical proof that Moonbase Alpha could not stand up to an attack by Daleks. Oh, that, no, the Daleks can go upstairs. Yes, well, never mind. 1996. Our mothership and the other Swifts landed on that planet. We called it Planet D. And considering this is a fairly goofy character... They just died. I, I really like Cribbin's performance. I th as I said, I think it would fail with any other actor. Maybe that's my knowledge of Cribbin's and what he means. What he means to the soul of this great nation! Um, sort of forgiving quite a few of the flaws with this episode. But I think it's, it's also a fun design as well. On my Security guard trod on his tail. Not to mention a headache. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's a fun design. Um, not great, but you know, it's probably the best they could do with this at the time. I, said I, haven't got a name. I also like that Landau and Baines seem genuinely. Brain. Well, that's not my name. That's what I. Warm and welcoming to this guy. I ever said was brain. That's why I, I think they're probably. Bernard Cribbins must have been reading this live on set. If you want to give me a name, call me Brian. All right, Brian. <laughs> we wouldn't want to get you wrong. Okay, lady. There's a sense of sort of this is a genuine interaction rather than them sort of reacting to pre-recorded dialogue. Hi. And there is an actor inside that prop peddling away. I can't remember his name, but he's a fairly a fairly well-known face from certain British comedy shows. Oh, what? Have you recorded it? Oh no, I haven't, no, change it. I also love that the Brian prop is only just thin enough to fit through the doors. Oh, like from Planet D? They really have to line him up just right to get him through some of these narrow doorways. Hello, everybody! Hello. Yeah, it's a tight squeeze getting through that command centre door. Dog, I really... And Tony is instantly enchanted. Tony, our head of security, is like, Whoa, oh, how about that? It's a cute robot with a smiley face. I'm sorry, I can't shake hands. I haven't got a hand, but uh, you can pat me if you like. Annie Lambert is given a bit more business to do here. Stroking Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here we go, famous moment, famous romantic moment. Yellow plastic wheels! Oh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, really. I mean, that trolley don't mean anything to me. We're just good friends. I can certainly appreciate that some people really hate this episode for, you know, just how far the series has, I wouldn't say fallen, but changed since since year one i mean since the days of dragon's domain and, and black sun and all that and in some series two episodes you can see in martin landau's face he is thinking the same thing Iconic. Um, but he doesn't seem to be here i'll get back and i'll check that change i just get this impression that, that lunch landau and bane are just genuinely enthusiastic about cribbins i've, I've got nothing to back that up it's just I have this vision of him just being off screen with the microphone. Thank you, I'd like that very much. And they must have just liked the guy, because we all like Bernard Cribbins. He's lovely. Crew, not to say my captain. And he's got a bit of a sad story. Try to help. Why, aren't we? He had a crew of humans, because remember, this was an Earth ship. I know, why should I mind? I'd be delighted, really. Yeah. But they all have mysteriously died in mysterious circumstances. Ah, so. all these doors are so narrow. Ah. He's commenting on it. Again, could be an ad lib. What do you make of that? I'm not sure. Well, what is it? <laughs> it's a robot, Tony. It's a robot. Try and keep up. Self monitoring, too. Was it alive? Uh, That's a difficult question. Depends what you mean by alive. 
Well, I don't know what I mean. Oh, what a surprise. But that sure made my day. <laughs> As security chief of Moonbase Alpha, I, I have no concerns about this um, supercomputer we've just let in and interface with our own equipment, and uh, I certainly won't be putting any of my security men on it. Oh, Maya, we'll give it a chance. It's doing a check for us. We don't know where we're heading yet. He's got a smiley face, Maya. Come on. Your brain works like a computer, so you're jealous of that other computer. Ah, yes. The first of several really rubbish lines that Tony gets in this episode. What are they doing on Swift? Open a channel. Okay. Oh, a wavy line. Even Tony knows something's wrong there. Because the Swift is taking off! Oh, no! It was obviously a trap. And Tony Vanessi's expert moon-based security... Oh, somehow they got past him. And he's made off into space with Koenig and Helena. No response. We've been cut off. Where are they? Speaking of where, um... I take it the rest of the Alphans who evacuated... Are they back? I would assume they are back, because we later see... Fraser on the moon, but then he escorted Swift in, so... I'm sorry. Where is Where is everybody who left? John, it's just a machine. What do you think you're doing? Shut up! And there we go, first signs that Brian is, um, well, he's got a bit more going on than just, uh, he's more than just a smiley face. Just go through for a minute. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely prop. Come to my pilot console. I, I know it, it was displayed at exhibitions in subsequent years. Does it still survive? I'm not sure. I'd like to think that Brian does survive somewhere. But now the Swift is moving very far away from the moon, very fast. Come on in. Oh. I've been expecting you, Mr. Koenig. Trim is back to Moonbase Alpha. No, wait! Yeah, and, and Cribbins again is doing a, a sort of American accent, which you wouldn't expect to work for him, and yet somehow it does. Ah, a blue planet. Planet D. You got it, lady. Ah, yeah, Planet D. Uh, 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 Commander, it's channeled through me. And this is a nice spaceship set. It's quite roomy, which is nice. Program the spaceship to return to Alpha. And the sets you can see in the control consoles in the background, there is a definite design lineage between this ship. B. I, I don't know. I, I, I can't place this chronologically, whether this was like 10 years before Alpha? Oh no, he said... He mentioned Alpha, didn't he? So... It must have all been concurrent technology. I don't need air, do I? Again, it's a cheap you know, way to reuse old props, but it does make sense. This is an Earth ship from the same period, roughly. And he's threatened them. Why are you taking us to Planet D? Put your gun down and I'll tell you. I'm not gonna harm you. I'm your friend. You know, Cody, I can't eject one without the other, and if you go into space, she goes. One... Oh, he's threatening them with the airlock. Again, that will come into play later. Although this shot is strange because he opens the inner door, but he doesn't open the outer door. I don't quite understand how that vacuum effect was created there. But anyway, panel. forcing Koenig to put his gun down into a little panel that swallows it up. There it was, gone. Let us through to Alpha. I'd give you service with a smile, lady, but uh, I can't smile, as you can imagine. Although I do have a very pretty face. <laughs> There's the service. Oh, I I don't know. It's, um, he, he does smile. His, his mouth is almost a permanent smile. Again, I like it's it's something you'd see in, in Doctor Who probably after this really that the um, the mouth would light in time with the dialogue. Nothing but a mathematical sine wave. And in command center, all they're getting is the wavy line. The brain had the same computer as ours. When it got in here, it somehow gave the command: eradicate. Is that true? You've blinded them so they can't communicate. I guess so. Ain't I a stinker? <laughs> Landau just doing it. Not a face palm, but a sort of thumb on forehead. Going into orbit around some gravity centre. Mm. So, who's going to get up off his backside and do something? I'm waiting to hear from you. What's going on? Bill Fraser. Has it been wiped out? I also like his line, I've been, I've been sitting on Eagle One waiting to hear from you. It's functioning, but uh, we can't get an answer. Not in Eagle One. He's, he's been on Eagle One. He got in his spacesuit and climbed on top of his Eagle. I'm sure he didn't, but... Uh, Commander and Dr. Russell have been abducted on that Swift, and we've got to get them back. I'll go after them. Now, we'll go after them with a whole squadron of eagles. Come on, Maya. Yeah. Yeah, come on, Fraser. 
our established Chief Eagle pilot. Anyone know the name Alan Carter? Not this week. We're going after them with a whole squadron of eagles. Best leave Alan behind. This also now means I think Yasko is in command of Alpha, so that'll go well for them. You know what these boys of yours are showing? They're showing loyalty. Yeah, well, I, I like that. Uh, I'm going to make a note of that. And you have to look at this story of essentially a, a renegade artificial intelligence. Oops, I'm gonna... And it's hard not to compare it back to the first series with the Infernal Machine. We had a, this living robot spaceship voiced by Leo McKern. No! There are several episodes in the second series where you can make that kind of parallel to something from the first season, and it's almost like the same idea, but produced for a, almost a different show entirely. This is a much more... Could be a trap. Well, juvenile take on, on the same concept, and yet it it does... I still find this quite appealing. I know there are people out there who hate this one. Think you want, Tony? Go ahead. I'm not one of them, but I would definitely say it's... John. It's a guilty pleasure. Despite some terrible dialogue, and we are about to get one of those lines from, uh, from Bill Fraser here. You won't be able to get back. We can't just leave you. You must. Tell them you're okay. I've got food and drink. What do you want, music? I'll read a roll doll story to you. Did you check whether the moon and planet D are on a collision course? Sure. The moon and planet D are not on a collision course. Three. What course are they on? They're going in circles round each other, and they'll go on spinning round each other until the end of time. Which I assume is a lie. He's playing some crazy hijacking slot machine. Ah. Slot machine, you plastic pinbrain, you! Come on, nobody in their right mind would ever say that line. I want all personnel back on moon base. Yes, sir. Poor John Hug. What a, what a mouthful as well. That's just... Ugh. Damn it, man. You're supposed to be being established as part of Alpha's command structure here. Don't blow it. Very impressed. I'm making a note. I love the way he says that as well several times in this episode. I'm making a note. So, all the eagles are going home. All four of them. All communications cut. They can't see or hear us now. Don't think that's how it works. Okay, send all the other eagles back. We'll go on. We've got our own foolproof computer, Maya. Because unless the Swift has turned off their own sensors, there's no way they can't detect Eagle One following them. Where's the Swift heading for? Planet D? It's obviously Planet D. Planet D. Ah! I want to be on Planet D, waiting when that thing gets there. So even though they've got a head start, we can turn on our boosters and get there before them, somehow. And they won't detect us. It's fine. Yeah, a bit of a leap there to to accept that the Swift, and particularly Brian, can't detect Eagle One. Just because they turned off the radio. Does it have air? Yeah, but there's a kind of mist that could be poison. Oh, come on, folks. Be happy. Don't you love each other? And here we go. Uh, one of the uh, one of several episodes in the second series that kind of pushed the uh, of course not. the idea that the the two main couples of the show were in love. Uh, think also the Beta Cloud and One Moment of Humanity. I want one of you in each. And for some reason. Well, how about this? Ooh. Oh. Yes, Brian has a. Brian can create. Is it ultraviolet? Do no good. You're yeah, Helena somehow knows that it's ultraviolet light. Please turn it off. Get into the airlock. All right, just turn it off. But yeah, we're going down this sort of plot cul-de-sac here. Of Brian really wants to know whether they're in love or not. Come on, come on. Because if he finds out that they are, then he has. He can. He's got a hold over each of them for the life of the other. But it's kind of obvious by this point that you come along. neither of them are gonna let the other die they'll they'll go along with whatever brian says no matter what there. right i'd also love to know what part of the brian prop the guy inside can actually see out of lady into the next one it's got to be somewhere on the head be all right let's get a close-up of brian's face thing i've got to know about you two i can't see where he would be looking out from i've really got to know Oh, there's a grill on the, um, just below the neck, I suppose. This lady. And now it almost feels like we're having a wedding. Dr. Helena Russell. Do you take this moon base commander to be your lawful wedded screen husband? No, I don't. Wow. That's it. 
They're each shut in an airlock. This is Brian's love test. It's later referred to as a love test. I'm gonna let the air out. Again, it's it's an interesting idea that Brian would be sort of interested in human psychology and human relationships. Do you see the black one? But I, 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 I just feel this is kind of padding, this whole love test thing. Hair's getting thinner. Because like I said, there's no way he, he isn't already fully aware that they wouldn't sacrifice their lives for each other. Airlock. You get it, Koenig? If you press your button, all the rest of your air goes to the lady. How romantic. So, anyone up for suffocation? I gotta tell you, you can't communicate with each other. No way, folks. <laughs> That's against the rules. Yeah, we can't hear Koenig or Helena inside the airlocks. I really like the, the smiley face on Brian. Again, I said the, the way the, the, the mouth lights up and such. It's, it's a very nice looking character. Which again, it is a credit to the designers. He's meant to look benign and friendly which of course Cribbin supports with the voice and then we get to almost torture moments like this this robot with this very smiley face just watching them you know one to the other ah you're running out of time folks so the air is being pumped out who will be the first one to give their air to the other because Someone's got to do it. There's no way they could just decide to keep it for themselves. Well, wouldn't you know it. They both lunge for the transfer my air to the other airlock button. Simultaneous! At the same time. Oh, your air back. Hey. Oh. Whoa. Ah. You love each other. What? This is uh, this is almost like um, Brian the Brain's blind date all of a sudden. Eighteen carat gold crunch on the other, <sighs> which you must have known you already had. <laughs> Again, I have to assume this is Cribbins ad libbing. I want to believe. I want to believe that Bernard Cribbins went on that set and everybody loved him, and even the Americans who didn't quite understand what he was just instantly took to him because. He was just such a nice guy. Yeah, it really, it really felt sad, and I don't often feel genuinely sad at celebrity deaths anymore. Partly because the people involved with these shows, it's just, it's happening now so quick, so many every month. There's like a dozen people. And I'm on wheels, I told you. But it was something like. What are you after? I'll tell you, Koenig. As I said, he was um, he, he voiced a lot of children's shows, worked on a lot of family productions. It was almost like a voice from your childhood. You know, the narrator of the Wombles. And his his technique with, with those shows, and particularly with Jack and Nori, and I think he admitted it himself, was in delivering a performance that made it feel like he was talking directly to one viewer, one child, and you were that viewer. And it's okay, I'll keep the... It's a very rare gift that he had. How you feel. And I can't think of many others who were as good as uh, as good at that as he was. Oh, anyway, Brian's latest plan, now that we have landed on planet D, is uh, to send Koenig out to pick up some fuel from the mothership. At least I think it's the mothership that's stranded on the surface. And uh, to do this, we have to go out in the silver spacesuit that we saw in the Seance Spectre. I think it's making its first appearance here. I mean, I'm sure it's just a regular Alpha spacesuit. Re well, no, it wouldn't be repainted, would it? Because you couldn't really repaint a costume. I don't know. Maybe it's the one from um, the day after tomorrow. That's more likely, actually, yeah. With a repainted uh, helmet, perhaps. Anywho, they are now on Planet D. Koenig is about to head out over to the mothership and what follows is a very strange sequence and I say that considering that this is a show the second season was almost like gotta have action 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 all the way if the characters aren't you know talking about an exciting action thing then they're doing an exciting action thing here we get a solid two minutes of Martin Landau slowly walking across a misty planet set which does Look, to be fair, it does look nice and alien. I think the music is helping. It's a very minimal set otherwise. Just, uh, you know, 
dusty ground, some rocks, a few trees, and a lot of mist. The mist is um, probably covering a multitude of sins here. And of course, a dead body that Koenig has found. One of the mothership crew? But yes, it's a, it's a very long two minute scene. Nice music, though. And again, it also paints a, a, a memorably. I think it ties back into the, the first season as well. The show's general approach to the the idea of mankind in space is it's going to be a total disaster. Just the image of these these people, these dead bodies, preserved forever on the surface of a totally alien world. It is quite quite haunting when you stop to think about it. But then we go back to Brian. John. Yes, okay. He said okay. <laughs> uh, not to worry, lady. So who's worried? Yeah. Yeah, I always love that that with this this show, the pessimistic streak regarding humanity's place in space. Every mission is gonna be a glorious failure. What was he like? That's him. Ah, Bernard Cribbins. Father. Oh. to Swift. I'm now in the vicinity of the mothership. Connie, what do you see? Well, I don't see a model of the mothership. That would be too expensive to show this week, apparently. Can't see you, can hardly hear you. Going around to the blind side of the ship now. Out. Mm. John? I was going to say that perhaps he's not mentioning what he can see because he can see Tony's eagle. But I think in the next scene we find out that's not true. We just don't get to see a mothership model at all. We just have this... Uh, this orange ladder. Looking quite flimsy. Anyway, Koenig is now aboard. Another spooky dark ship with cobwebs. John! Ah, and Tony. Tony and Maya were just standing around in the dark, apparently. Yeah, well, we landed ahead of you, so we came aboard. You see what's out there? Mm. Yeah. Presumably the crew. I tested the atmosphere. Toxic, deadly. They went out without their suits. They must have been crazy. Oh, and there's Bernard Cribbins himself playing a dead body, Captain Michael's dead body. Permission to test the console, Commander. Permission granted. Make it fast. We've got to get back to Helena. Is anything working? No, because it's the same wibbly wobbly line. A sine wave. The same response as our moon base. That means the mothership is blind. That brain is mad. Blinded a computer on its own mothership. That's why the crew didn't know about the poison and went out there and died. That's why Captain Michael was left alone with no means of life support. Yes. And at first, I, I like the way you, you're meant to think, you know, he's just done this because he's the villain. Brain kidnap you. But I like the motivation that we're about to discover here for why he did what he did to... It wants to live forever, Maya. ...to his crew and the man who created him. Listen, how do we get at the brain? Tony's just opened one of those yellow um, salt skip things that you find on the side of roads. Part of the universe. Grit, grit skip things by breaking its mind <coughs> breaking its mind confusing it to the extent it doesn't know what it's doing you should be able to handle that tony you're a very confusing fellow i had a good look at captain michael i know you did my oh mm. aha hello what's this bits of brian wait a minute there we go there's another wait a minute that's our second one this week that's something you need to add to the Space 1999 drinking game, which I believe is a thing. Every time they say, wait a minute. Yes, it does, Tony. I think I know what this was going to be. What do you want to, John? How do we get you aboard? I can fit into your pocket. You don't deserve an answer, Tony. I shall only reveal what I know when it's convenient for the plot. And you won't be there when I do it. Ah, Maya's turned herself into a mouse. Easy, Maya. I got her. Oh, Maya, Maya Mouse is really panicking there. He really wants to get out. Taking his time. He's got to find the fuel store, unlock... That's something that happens occasionally in this show, where Maya turns into an animal, and the animal clearly doesn't want to be there. It's called it reliable? He's reliable. And another slow plod back to the Swift. But this time... There he's, he is! He's got the fuel cell. Have you got it all? And he's got Maya in his pocket somewhere. I'm approaching with a fuel core. She must have turned herself into a mouse that's resistant to poison toxic gas because uh, I don't know if he'd have an airtight pocket on that spacesuit specifically to hold mice. But who knows? We've now got to climb the ladder. All right, said Koenig, climbing up the ladder with his fuel cell. Going to give it to Brian. He looks a bit tired. Wow, 
Oh, and Brian is screaming at him. Come on, come on, come on. Let him be compressed properly. He's fine. Come on, colleague. <laughs> it's also rare to hear Bernard Cribbins play a villain, which is quite nice. And he's got no patience for this. Why don't you two colleague get to the fuel? Uh, Dr. Russell, open the hatch there, number four. Brian? Incidentally, I saw your crew scattered all over the planet's surface, Ooh. lying dead. So they're dead. And Captain Michael, sitting at his command desk, also dead. My father? Well, that gets through to him. Almost. Oh, Dr. Russell, will you open the hatch? Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, now you see, the trouble with Brian here is he's being too hasty. Now, you never get nowhere if you're too hasty. I know, it's the second right said Fred in a minute, but I have to do it as Ben Cribbins. Okay, yes, calm down. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure to what extent the Swift and Brian are linked to the point where he can feel the fuel being inserted. To live forever. Stand by for takeoff. Oh, that's a nice dramatic close up on Brian there with the dramatic music. I do love this piece of incidental music, by the way. I think this is probably one of my favourite pieces from the second year. Because it feels like that that bombastic Barry Gray, big, beautiful machines moving around music we used to get. Take it easy. Can't approach too close or the brain might blind us. Oh, but you already established that he can't see your eagle, so... Oh, Koenig didn't hide Maya in his spacesuit. He hid her in the... His uniform jacket. That seems even more unsafe for poor old Maya. What's that? A mouse? Get rid of it! It's biting my antenna! Where did they come from? Planet D. There are no mice on Planet D. I love the way he stops absolutely dead to deliver that line. Is and with a tone of shock. There are no mice on Planet D. What? I, I find it. It's one of those lines, one of those odd lines that just kind of sticks in your head. Revenge. Ooh. You don't have a message from Captain Michael? Listen, mortals, what do you think you can do against me? I'm in complete control of this spaceship and everything aboard it. I also like that Brian's power comes through control of the ship rather than weaponry as such. He doesn't seem to have any weapons of his own except for that UV light. Kill him. I did not kill him. I don't know how he died. He died because you blinded his computer. His crew was misled, and he was left with no means of life support. Oh, you're a naughty robot. Created you. Your own father. Why? Now listen, both of you. I know why you killed him. He was working on a... I also like the way Brian is being backed off towards the, the airlock. But every so often he resurges forwards, and Landau and Bane really have to sort of jump back quickly so they don't get, you know, the corner of the prop smashing into their shin or something. Brain could not be made. Uh. That's what he discovered. That's what Koenig saw on the Swift. Or the mothership, even. Be a better friend. Brian, too. On me. I will make my the Embryoning. I'm going to sweep you out into space. No, no. You can't solve your problems by killing us the way you killed Captain Michael. I did. Yes, he can. Captain Michael. Yes, you did. I he, did not. He told me. Who told you? Captain Michael. And here he is. In person. Brain. <laughs> Bernard Cribbins looking like a zombie. Brain, I want to talk to you. Covered in cobwebs. And again, this is a kind of a Star Trek thing of talking the evil computer into not quite killing itself, but uh, defeating itself here. My father! He conceived you. He made you. He's wiser than you and greater than you. And you killed him. And Landau is, is giving it his, his all here for this fairly silly character. I do sometimes wonder if they had told this story in the first season, what kind of prop would they have created for Brian? And I can't, I can't really think that they would have been able to do much, much different. And Brian in, in season one just would not work at all. But there we go, they've blown him out of the airlock, shut the door just on his antennae, so he's not adrift in space, but he's out of the ship. Let's contact Tori. I'll stop this swift for docking procedure. Oh, nice ADR there. Eagle one to Commander Koenig, we are receiving him. Let me talk to Tony. Right here. Then talk to me, I'm Bill Fraser. Ah, and the Swift has stopped. And this leaves us with uh, an oddly unsettled plot point. Record from the brain and take it back to Alpha. But the brain still has its antenna. We'll destroy it, cut it. 
If you destroy my antenna, my memory core will be wiped clean. Moon base will be blind forever. Mm. If you don't get me back in, I'll wipe it clean anyway. I'll take that chance. Uh-oh. Cut the antenna. Now don't cut my antenna! Please don't cut my antenna! All right, Brian. We'll let you live if you give us your memory core undamaged. Yes, take my memory! Take everything! All I wanted was life and friends. Mm. I'm so lonely. Take it all. Oh, I feel sorry for him here. <laughs> He's crying and he's sad. But again, this is a fairly unresolved part of the episode. What what the hell do they do with Brian after this? The obvious thing would be to take the Swift and Brian back to Alpha. And I, I don't know what you'd do with Brian, but surely the Swift would be of use. All right, let's see if it works. But it's just so... It's not mentioned. It's operational. Yeah, the thing's working again. We still don't know where we're going. Direction check. Horizon data direction check. All our extras are back, so the Alphans must have returned en masse. Operational. Hey. Not spinning around planet D. We're on the same course. We always were. Another lie from Brian the Brain. Oh, so no need to panic. What do you intend to do about the Brain Commander? Yeah, what are we going to do? So he's still hanging out of the swift airlock. Blind and taken away its memory. Listen, when it was operational, it killed a lot of people. Yeah, but you kill a lot, a lot of people with your own competence every day, so... We could always reinstall its memory core. So, that could be dangerous. I think it's also a bit difficult to understand what they're actually discussing here. Yeah, we program our own morality into it. Give it the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah, oh. you could order it to self-destruct if it ever harbours any evil thoughts again. Hmm. So, brain surgery seems to be the solution. Return the memory core to Swift. Yes, Commander. Hey, Maya. Oh, God, here's another uh, terrible you line. The brain's memory. You better not transform yourself into a yellow-wheeled trolley. Well, this console will get up and chase you. <laughs> I get the impression they just reprogram Brian to be good and then send the Swift on its way. Are we going to have any... But that would seem to be a massive waste of potential resources. The new stuff for the next month. With this spaceship, this Earth spaceship, it's compatible with their own technology and it's right on in their own hands and they just let it go? I don't know. The ending... Brian's fate is really vague here. It's a test that we... Uh... And another show, it might be a sort of setup for introducing him as a regular character. I don't think that would work, but I wouldn't mind it seeing him again, just knocking around doing odd jobs. Although Bernard Cribbins is a very strong persona that would just probably overwhelm the show. And uh, so maybe it is just best that we only really got the one performance of him from, uh, from Brian the Brain. I find that a genuinely entertaining episode. I mean, as I said, it's a long way from the, the heights of the first season, but within just the second season alone, it's fairly fun, it's fairly harmless. Um, the show committed many worse sins than, uh, than Brian the Brain. So on the whole, thumbs up here. Well, Ooh. it's Space yes. 1999, but nice. not as some people would like to know it, being year two. <laughs> but at it's least we get a bit of Bernard Cribbins. I mean, Bernard Cribbins oh, makes yeah, everything lovely. better. Yes, I mean, well, is there a show that he hasn't been in? It's extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, well, I'm, I'm I mean, yes. sure there's, the, the there's answer hundreds is yes, of but I'm shows just saying, that he hasn't yes, been but, in. But, but, yes, but, you know, he's, he's, quite, he's fairly ubiquitous, particularly around the sort of 70s, early 80s. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, he was doing a lot around yeah. then. And uh, how nice, nice that he makes an appearance not, not that many weeks after he sadly passed away. So, yeah, yeah that's right. nice, nice randomizer. Well done. Hmm. Lovely. Do you have any more things you'd like to add before we close up shop? Well, no, I don't, because week, I'm saving I mean. everything else for next week. Well, that's I think a great it's be idea. A, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a good one next week. So, you know, thank you for bearing with us through this week. But the good stuff is all next week. As always, the good stuff will be <laughs> the next time you listen, not this That's time. That's right. Uh, so thank you. Yes, thank you for enduring your clammy ears, for enduring uh, me, Chris and Richard. And we'll be back with you, Podster, on next week. In the meantime, please do make sure you've subscribed and that you maybe even do us a rating. That's a review and a rating. Oh, yeah. A review yeah. being some form of words where you say mm -hmm. nice things and the rating being the number of stars you give us. Oh, so please can I recommend. Um, what a fantastic podcast. So nostalgic, so full of joy. I'm a very happy Podstron. Five stars. Podstron, yeah, five. Right, there you go. Great. Click. Thank done. you. Well done. There you go. That's one more review. Uh, but seriously, mm -hmm. they do really, really help, and we do appreciate reading them. So please do give us a rating. Otherwise, we'll go away now and leave you to your week and let you dry off your clammy ears. And um, yeah. that's about it, really, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's about it. Good. Then goodbye. Bye.
Stage one complete. Let's go. Um, from my office window, yes. I can now see across the valley, uh, yes. onto the valley, onto the mountain road. Oh, and there is dynamic, yes. an absolutely enormous uh, sort of double trailered lorry driving along the mountain road. And it's right. just making me think of uh, sort of a Thunderbirds episode. Oh yeah, uh, you know where it, it's there's a bit of a, a mudslide from the, yes. the hill above, and yes, the wheels happen. lose grip, and the back yes. thing starts to roll down the hill, and <sighs> the, oh no, it's just it's just gone, it's just, it's just gone because, on the road as oh, normal. Because real life is never as exciting as a Thunderbirds episode, isn't it? <laughs> no. Isn't it disappointing? Well, I mean, I'm quite glad not to be in constant peril, and uh, you know, yeah, needing to be rescued yeah. all the blooming time. But uh, no, that was that was very I uneventful. Mean, but there's a thought, Jamie. If Uh-oh. you wanted your life to mirror any Jerry Anderson series, oh, come what on. would it be? Um, now, me, me, I'd like to dress as a vicar and drive a vintage car. Yes. I mean, if the, yeah? as they go, I don't be think fun. that would be too bad, would it? They, they no, don't, never wouldn't. got into any sort of super serious scrapes. No. no. Um, exactly. Yeah, occasionally. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what's the most appealing. I mean, Stingray's quite fun, but I... Yes. Mm, I'm not sure what the, the humidity... Uh, uh, is that going to be good? Oh, really? Uh, maybe not. Not good for your hair. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, so rude. <laughs> so rude. <laughs> sorry, I just slipped out. I didn't mean anything by that. Yeah, thanks. Um, gosh. Space precinct, maybe? <laughs> just because of the amount of travel you get, I yeah, guess? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go in those uh, police cruisers. how many Avios points I'd have after all those <laughs> miles. It'd be amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, there you go. Just right, a thought. Well, I'll see okay. you in Space Precinct, Officer Oren. Uh, all right. Yeah, see you then. SBA. SBA. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.